I get asked a lot if I believe in evolution. And I always say, no, I don't believe in evolution. I accept evolution. And so this lecture is going to be kind of a quick list of the main, some of the main reasons why I accept evolution. And it's based on the evidences that I have been able to, to see. So here is my quick list. Number one, fossils. There is a rich fossil record that we now have of all types of organisms. Um, now, not all organisms fossilize, but those that do, we have a very rich fossil record for, the, for those types of organisms. And you can go to an area of the world and find the more uh, ancient fossils, lower in the, in, in, a, in the rock layers, and the more recent fossils in the top layers. And as you do this, you can see these transitionary forms in, in many, many lineages. One real classic example is we've been able to find the transitionary forms from dinosaurs to birds in, in a fossil, for example, like Archaeopteryx, and, there's bun and there are many, many others. Number two, biogeography. There are patterns that we see on this planet that organisms that are geographically connected or live more closely to one another geographically tend to be more similar. So, you know, we can see this if we look at island groups like the finches, uh, the Darwin's finches on Galapagos, and how they're closely related to each other, and then they're most closely related to finches from South America. Or we can also look at, for example, giraffes in Africa. And you can see that the different giraffes that have the most similar coat pattern are also the giraffes that are most closely related based on all of their genetics. And they're the ones that live geographically um, next to each other as well. Number three, comparative anatomy and homology. Homology is defined as similarity in a feature or a structure or something that is due to common ancestry because similarity could also be due to convergent evolution, right? The fact that you have a marsupial mole and a placental mole is an example of convergent evolution because the marsupial mole is more closely related to a kangaroo than it is to the placental mole. But when things are similar and that similarity is due to common ancestry, we call that being we call that as a homology or being homologous. So here is a great example of homologous structures. If you look at the forearm of all of these vertebrates, you see that the arrangement is exactly the same. A humerus, an ulna, and radius. Sometimes they're fused together, like for example in the whale, there, there's a fusion between the ulna and the radius. And sometimes there might be a, a, a slight change in the reduction of the number of digits. But the overall pattern is the same. How do you explain that? Well. All of these organisms could come from a common ancestor and then evolved into each of the different forms. A similar story could also be told for insects. Why do all insects have three body parts, six legs, one pair of antennae? Because their common ancestor had that same body plan. Number four, vestigial organs. It turns out that in many organisms, there are these structures or organs that we see that are almost, they look like they're left over, like they don't belong. And, and so you ask yourself, why is that there? Well, it's there because it's leftover evolutionary baggage. It's basically something that is evolving, either a, that, that is evolving away, but is not all the way evolved, <laughs> not all the way gone yet, right? So in this baleen well, which is a well that is still alive today, you could go out, cut into its blubber, and you would find this rudimentary pelvic girdle of the hind limbs. It's still there. It has no function whatsoever. It doesn't do anything at all. But it's still there. And it's there because whales and dolphins evolved from terrestrial organisms. And we can actually go back and look at examples from the fossil record and see that in these transitionary forms, you see that exact same pattern. You see the hind limb getting smaller and smaller and smaller. Um, a similar story is also true for many snakes, um, like this python snake here, that also has rudimentary hind limbs still present. There are even vestigial structures in humans, like the tailbone, or muscles around the ear, wisdom teeth, the appendix, and so forth. Number five, comparative embryology. When you look at organisms in their early embryological stages, you see that they are very similar. So, for example, the organism on the left is a chicken, and the organism on the right is a human. But in early embryological stages, we have gill pouches that are similar, post-anal tails that are similar, and we just we look very similar. 
Now, as development continues, the differences uh, begin to appear. Um, but this, the, the fact that, that you would expect that in early stages to look the same and that this is the case is a powerful evidence also for evolution. Number six, when you look at nature, it's hierarchical. So here's just an example from the carnivora. These organisms are all this, uh, have a lot of similarities and they're organized in a way that you see that it's a hierarchical structure. Now, this is the best way to organize life is based on hierarchy. And this was done even before evolution was, was, uh, was talked about by Darwin. For example, Carl Linnaeus, he's the one that came up with the idea of naming things on a species, genus, family, right? These, this this, this um, Linnaean classification system. And it turns out, though, that this also is explained because there was a common ancestor that was a carnivore and then that diversified into these different lineages that eventually led to all of the species that are alive on the planet today. Number seven, artificial selection. I really like this one and this was also a favorite of Charles Darwin because he looked at lots of different organisms that humans were actively uh, making decisions on which varieties and which breeds were, were going to be the ones that reproduced. And so, for example, back in his day, the, these types of vegetables were just finished being breeding in a sense, right? Broccoli, cauliflower, cabbage, kale, and, and Brussels sprouts all come from an ancestor that's essentially like this. And this is documented. We know that this is what happened because there were farmers who said, uh -huh, I'm going to make a plant that has extremely large flower parts. And so they selectively um, looked for those flowers in their field that had the biggest flower parts. And those were the ones that they reproduced, not the others. And they would do that over and over and over again each generation until eventually you get cauliflower. Or you look for the, the plants that have the largest leaves. And you do that over and over and over again until you get cabbage and, and so forth. And the same story is true for dogs. You, what variety of dog do you want? I want one that can hunt. I want one that can get in holes. I want one that runs fast. And br dog breeders have been doing this for a long time. Originally for more um, real, uh, real life uh, help, you know, helping humans perform some function. But more recently just, you know, what looks cute or what can fit in a purse. Number eight, new organisms. A powerful evidence for evolu evolution is the fact that new organisms are appearing on the planet all the time. Here's a really kind of fun example. In 1935, Wallace Carruthers invented a, a new synthetic substance never before seen on planet Earth called nylon. And nylon, of course, has been used in, in different threads and, and stockings. Well, outside of one of the factories, there was this pond and there all of a sudden was these back, not all of a sudden, but over time there was this growth of bacteria and some scientists went and looked at this and this bacteria was doing things a little bit different than other bacteria and so they went in and looked at the genes of this bacteria and this bacteria had a gene called hydrolase and a lot of most bacteria have this gene as well especially bacteria that are similar to this one and what had happened is this hydrolase gene had copied itself. So the entire gene had been copied. Well, you don't need two copies of hydrolase. And so one copy was free to receive mutations. And as these mutations accumulated, one mutation happened in one strain of these bacteria that actually produced now a new gene that had a new function. It had an enzyme called nylonase that produced an enzyme called nylonase that could break down the byproducts of nylon. Well, nylon's never been on the planet until that 1935. So this bacteria had never been exposed to this resource, but once it was exposed to it, this a mutation hit happened to make now a gene that could break down nylon and the bacteria thrived on that and that's where you got the large growth of this bacteria. And number nine, molecular biology. This is a very powerful evidence of evolution. Um, and this is where you take you know, the DNA sequences and you compare them organism by organism. And as we've done this, we see, for example, that chimpanzees and humans share 98.5% of all of their DNA nucleotides are the exact same. And then there are a little bit more differences with gorillas and orangutans and gibbons and so forth. How else would you explain the fact that humans and chimps share 98.5% of their DNA? And this is, and remember that most of our DNA 
is not even used for coding. It's just DNA that's there that's either used for spacing or other stuff, but, or, or it's DNA that is functionless, that maybe has no function whatsoever. And much of this DNA also is DNA that is just copied over and over again, repeat DNA. And those pieces of DNA are the exact same in humans and, and chimpanzees, or 98.5% the same. Well, how else would you explain that? Well, the best explanation is evolution, that there was a common ancestor of humans and chimpanzees that since the diversification of those two, some differences have accumulated, but not very many because we share a, a recent common ancestor only about seven million years ago. So those are my list of some of the most powerful evidences for why I accept evolution. Mm -hmm.